Chapter One of The Uncle of an Angel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Susan Morin, Portland, Maine. The Uncle of an Angel by Thomas A. Janvier. Chapter One. When Mr. Hutchinson Port, a single gentleman, who admitted that he was forty seven years old, and who actually was rising sixty, of strongly fixed personal habits, and with the most positive opinions upon every conceivable subject, came to know that by the death of his widowed sister he had been placed in the position of guardian of that sister's only daughter, Dorothy, his promptly formed and tersely expressed conception of the situation was that the agency by which it had been brought about was distinctively diabolical. The fact may be added that during the subsequent brief term of his guardianship, Mr. Port found no more reason for reversing this hastily formed opinion than did the late King David for reversing his hastily expressed views in regard to the general tendency of mankind towards untruthfulness. The two redeeming features of Mr. Port's trying situation were that his duties as a guardian did not begin at all until his very unnecessary ward was nearly nineteen years old and did not begin actively his ward having elected to remain in france for a season under the mild direction of the elderly cousin who had been her mother's travelling companion until she was almost twenty when she was one and twenty, Mr. Port reflected with much satisfaction he would be rid of her. Neither by nature nor by education had Mr. Hutchinson Port been fitted to discharge the duties which thus were thrust upon him. His disposition was introspective but less in a philosophical sense than a physiological. For the central point of his introspection was his liver. That he made something of a fetish of this organ will not appear surprising when the fact is stated that Mr. Port was a Philadelphian in that city of eminent good cheer livers are developed to a degree that only strasburg can emulate naturally mr port's view of life was bounded more or less by what he could eat with impunity yet beyond this somewhat contracted region his thoughts strayed pleasantly afield into the far wider region of the things which he could not eat with impunity, but which, with a truly Spartan Epicureanism, he did eat, and bravely accepted the bilious consequences. The slightly anxious yet determined expression that would appear upon Mr. Port's clean-shaven, ruddy countenance as he settled himself to the discussion of an especially good and especially dangerous dinner, betrayed heroic possibilities in his nature which, 
being otherwise directed, would have won for him glory upon the martial field. In minor matters, that is to say, in all relations of life not pertaining to eating, Mr. Port was very much what was to be expected of him from his birth and from his environment. Every Sunday, with an exemplary piety, he sat solitary in the great square pew in St. Peter's, which had been occupied by successive generations of ports ever since the year 1761, when the existing church was completed. Every other day of the week, from his late breakfast time for some hours onward he sat at his own particular window of the philadelphia club and contemplated disparagingly the outside world over the top of his magazine or newspaper at four precisely for his liver's sake he rode in the park and for so stout a gentleman, Mr. Port was an excellent horseman. On rare occasions he dined at his club. Usually he dined out, for while generally regarded as a very disagreeable person at dinners, because of his habit of finding fault with his food on the dual ground of hygiene and quality, he was in social demand because his presence at a dinner was a sure indication that the giver of it had a good culinary reputation. In Philadelphia such a reputation is most highly prized. An irrelevant New York person, after meeting Mr. Port at several of the serious dinner parties peculiar to Philadelphia, had described him as the animated skeleton, and had supplemented this discourteous remark with the still more discourteous observation that as a feature of a feast the Egyptian article was to be preferred because it did not overeat itself and did keep its mouth shut. However, Mr. Port's obvious rotundity destroyed what little point was to be found in this meager witticism. And if it had not, the fact is well known in Philadelphia that New Yorkers, being descended not from an honorable Quaker ancestry, but from successful operations in Wall Street, are not to be held accountable for their unfortunate but unavoidable manifestations of frivolity at once inelegant and indecorous. In regard to his summers, Mr. Port, after a month spent for the good of his liver in taking the waters at the White Sulphur, of course went to Narragansett Pier. It may be accepted as an incontrovertible truth that a Philadelphian of a certain class who missed coming to the pier for August would refuse to believe, for the year at least, in the alternation of the four seasons, while an enforced absence from that damply delightful watering place for two successive summers very probably would lead to a rejection of the entire Copernican system. End of chapter 1is in the public domain. Poor dear mamma and I did not have a harsh word for years, Uncle Hutchinson, Miss Lee explained, in the course of the somewhat animated discussion that arose in consequence of Mr. Port's declaration 
that part of their summer would be passed in accordance with his usual custom at the white sulphur and of dorothy's declaration that she did not want to go there this her first summer in america was the third summer after mrs lee's translation and since dorothy had come into colors again she naturally wanted to make the most of them no not a single harsh word did we ever have we always agreed perfectly you know or if mamma thought differently at first she always ended by seeing that my point of view of the matter was the right one the only serious difference that i remember since i was quite a little girl was that last autumn in paris when i had everything so perfectly arranged for a delightful winter in st petersburg and when mamma was completely set in her own mind that we must go to the south of france her cough was getting very bad then you know and she said that a winter in russia certainly would kill her i don't think it would have killed her at least not especially but the doctor backed mamma up and said some horrid things to me in his polite french way and declared that st petersburg was not even to be thought of and so when i found that they were both against me that way of course i sacrificed my own feelings and told mamma that i would do just what she wanted and mamma cried and kissed me and said that i was an angel wasn't it sweet of her to be sure though she was having her own way and i wasn't and i think that i was an angel myself for i did want to go to russia dreadfully after all as things turned out we might almost as well have gone for poor dear mamma you know died that winter anyway but i'm glad i did what i could to please her and that she called me an angel for doing it don't you think that i was one don't you feel sir that it is something of an honor to be an angel's uncle now suppose i kiss you right on your dear little bald spot and then we make up our minds not to go to that horrid sulphur place at all everybody says that it's old-fashioned and stupid and that it's not the kind of an american watering place that i want to see you know it would have been all very well if we'd gone there while i was in mourning and had to be proper and quiet and retired and all that but i'm not in mourning any longer uncle hutchinson and you haven't said yet how you like this breakfast gown do you have to be told that white lace over pale blue silk is very becoming to your angel niece uncle hutchison and now you shall have your kiss and then the matter will be settled with which words miss lee a somewhat bewildering but unquestionably delightful effect in blonde and blue fluttered up to her elderly relative embraced him with a graceful energy and bestowed upon his bald spot the promised kiss but but indeed my dear responded mr port when he had emerged from miss lee's enfolding arms
You know that going to the white sulphur is not a mere matter of pleasure with me. It's one of hygienic necessity. You forget, Dorothy, Mr. Port spoke with the most earnest seriousness. You forget my liver. Now, Uncle Hutchinson, what is the use of talking about your liver that way? Haven't you told me a great many times already that it is an hereditary liver, and that nothing you can do to it will ever make it go right? And if it is bound to go wrong anyway, why can't you just try to forget all about about it and have as pleasant a time as possible that's the doctrine that i always preached to poor dear mamma she had an hereditary liver too you know and it's a very good one anyhow i've heard mamma say countless times that saratoga was a wonderfully good place for livers now why can't we go there? Mama always said that Saratoga was simply delightful. Horse racing going on all the time, and lovely drives, and rowing on the lake, and dancing all night long, and all sorts of lovely things. Let's go to Saratoga, Uncle Hutchinson. Mama said that the food there was delicious. And you know you always are grumbling about the food those sulphur people give you. But what really would be best of all for you, Uncle Hutchison, Miss Lee continued with increasing animation, is Carlsbad. Yes, that's what you really want. And while you are drinking the horrid waters, I can be having a nice time, you know. Then, when you're finished your course, we can take a run into Switzerland, and after that, in the autumn, we might go over to Vienna. You will be delighted with the Vienna restaurants, and they do have such good white wines there. And then, from Vienna, we really can go on and have a winter in Russia. Just think how perfectly delightful it will be to drive about in sleighs, all wrapped up in furs. Mr. Port shuddered. He detested cold weather. And to go to the court balls, and even perhaps to be present the next time they assassinated the Tsar. Oh, what a good time we are going to have! Do write at once this very day, Uncle Hutchison, to Carlsbad, and engage our rooms. To a person of Mr. Port's staid, deliberate temperament, this rapid outlining of a year of foreign travel, and this prompt assumption that the outline was to be immediately filled in and made a reality, was upsetting. His mental processes were of the Philadelphia sort, and when Miss Lee had completed the sketch of her European project, he still was engaged in consideration of her argument in favor of throwing over the white sulphur for Saratoga. However, he had comprehended enough of her larger plan to perceive that by accepting Saratoga promptly he might be spared the necessity of combating a far more serious assault upon his peace of mind and digestion. Travel of any sort was loathsome to Mr. Port for it involved much hasty and inconsiderate eating. Very well, he said, but not cheerfully, for this was the first time in a great many years that he had not made and acted upon plans shaped wholly in his own interest. 
we will try saratoga since you so especially desire it but if the waters affect my liver unfavorably we shall go to the white sulphur at once what we are not to go to carlsbad then oh uncle hutcheson i had set my heart upon it don't now don't be in a hurry to say positively that we won't go think how much good the waters will do you and think what a lovely time you can have when your course is over and you can eat just as much as you want of anything but even by this blissful prospect mr port was not to be lured and dorothy who combined a good deal of wisdom of the serpent with her presumable innocence of the dove perceived that it was the part of prudence not further to press for larger victory and from saratoga of course we shall go to the pier said mr port but with a certain aggressiveness of tone that gave to his assertion the air of a proposition in support of which argument might be required to narragansett you mean oh certainly from what several people have told me about narragansett i think that it must be quite entertaining and i want to see it and of course uncle hutcheson even if i didn't care about it at all i should go all the same for i want to fall in exactly with your plans and put you to as little trouble as possible you know for if your angel wasn't willing to be self-sacrificing she really wouldn't be an angel at all pleasing though this statement of early christian sentiment was it struck mr port as he subsequently revolved it slowly in his slowly moving mind as lacking a little on the side of practicality for miss lee so far unquestionably had contrived to upset with a fine equanimity every one of his plans that was not absolutely identical with her own End of chapter 2chapter three of the uncle of an angel by thomas a janvier this librivox recording is in the public domain on the whole the saratoga expedition was not a success even on the journey coming up by the limited train miss lee was not favorably impressed by the appearance of her fellow passengers nearly all the men in the car most of whom immediately betook themselves to the bar-room euphoniciously styled a buffet at the head of the train were of a type that would have suggested to one accustomed to american life that variety of it which is found seated in the high places of the government of the city of new york and the aggressively dressed and too abundantly jewelled female companions of these men heavily built heavy browed with faces marked in hard lines and with aggressive eyes schooled to look upon the world with a necessarily emphatic self-assertion were of a type that without special knowledge of american ways was entirely recognizable albeit miss lee 
having spent much time in the mixed society of various european watering-places was not by any means an unsophisticated young person and was not at all a squeamish one she was sensibly relieved by finding that the chair next to hers was occupied by a silvery-haired old lady of the most unquestionable respectability and her composure was further restored presently by the return to his chair on the other side of her of mr port who had betaken himself to what the conductor had told him was the smoking-room and who finding himself in a bar-room surrounded by a throng of hard-drinking foul-mouthed men had sacrificed his much-loved cigar in order to free himself from such distinctly offensive surroundings at their hotel and elsewhere miss lee and her uncle encountered many of their fellow-passengers by the limited train together with others of a like sort which previous trains had brought thither and while on the whole these were about balanced by a more desirable class of visitors they were in such force as to give to the life of the place a very positive tone at the end of a week dorothy avowed herself disappointed i never did think much of poor mamma's taste you know uncle hutchinson she said with her customary frankness and what she found to like in this place i'm sure i can't imagine it's tawdry and it's vulgar and as for its morals i think that it's worse than monte carlo i suppose that there is a nice side to it for i do see a few nice people but somehow they all seem to stand off from each other as though they were afraid here to take any chances at all with strangers and i don't blame them uncle hutchinson for i feel just that way myself what you ought to have done was to have hired a cottage and then people would have taken the trouble to find out about us and when they'd found that we were not all sorts of horrid things we should have got into the right set and no doubt at least if we'd stayed here through august we should have had a very nice time but we're not having a nice time here at this noisy hotel uncle hutchinson where the band can't keep quiet for half an hour at a time and where the only notion that people seem to have of amusement is to overdress themselves and wear diamonds to dinner and sit in crowds on the verandas and dance at night with any stranger who can get another stranger to introduce him and to drive over on fine afternoons to that place by the lake and drink mixed drinks until some of them actually get tipsy i really think that it all is positively horrid and so i'm quite willing now to go to the white sulphur it is stupid i know but i've always heard that it is intensely respectable i will get my packing all done this afternoon and we will start to-morrow morning i think you'd better go and telegraph for rooms right away but to dorothy's surprise and also to her chagrin mr port refused to entertain her proposition he fully agreed with her in her derogatory estimate of saratoga life as found at saratoga hotels and he cherished also a private grief incident to his mistaken belief that the cooking was not so good as he remembered it 
bright in the glamour of his sound digestion in his youthful past on the other hand however the waters certainly were having a most salutary effect upon his liver and the move to virginia would involve spending two days of hot weather in toilsome travel sustained only by such food as railway restaurants afford therefore mr port declared decidedly that until the end of july they would remain where they were and so gave his niece the doubtful pleasure of an entirely new experience by compelling her to do something that she did not want to do at all it was a comfort to mr port in later years to remember that he had got ahead of dorothy once anyhow being a very charming young person miss lee could not of course be grumpy yet grumpiness certainly would have been the proper word with which to describe her mood during her last fortnight at saratoga had she not possessed such extraordinarily fine gray eyes and such an admirably dimpled chin the fact must be admitted that she contrived to make her uncle's life so much of a burden to him that his staying powers were strained to the utmost indeed he admitted to himself that he could not have held out against such tactics for another week and he perceived that he had done injustice to his departed sister in thinking as he certainly had thought and even had expressed on more than one occasion in writing that in permitting her european movements to be shaped in accordance with her daughter's fancies she had exhibited an inexcusable weakness it was a relief to mr port's mind and also to his digestion for dorothy's grumpiness produced an effect distinctly bilious when the end of july arrived and his own and his charming ward's views once more were brought into harmony by the move to narragansett pier fortunately while somewhat disposed to stand upon her own rights miss lee was not a person who bore malice a pleasing fact that became manifest on the moment she began to pack her trunks i am afraid uncle hutchinson she observed on the morning that this important step towards departure was taken i am afraid that during the past week or so your angel may not have been quite as much of an angel as usual no replied mr port with a colloquial disregard of grammatical construction and with unnecessary emphasis i don't think she has but from this moment onward dorothy continued courteously ignoring her uncle's not too courteous interpolation and airily relegating into oblivion the recent past she expects to manifest her angelic qualities to an extent that will make her appear unfit for earth very possibly she may even grow a pair of wings and fly quite away from you sir right up among the clouds where the angels are and how would you like that uncle hutchinson in the sincere seclusion of his inner consciousness mr port admitted the thought that if dorothy had resolved herself into an angelic vol au vent a simile that came naturally to his mind at any time during the preceding fortnight he probably would have accepted the situation with a commendable equanimity but what he actually said was that her departure into this aerated fashion 
would make him profoundly miserable. Mr. Port was a little astonished at himself when he was delivered of this gallant speech. For gallant speeches, as he very well knew, were not at all in his line. On this amicable basis thus established, Miss Lee and her guardian resumed their travels, and accepting only Mr. Port's personal misery incident to the elementary exigencies of railway transportation, their journey from the central region of New York to the seaboard of Rhode Island was accomplished without misadventure. End of chapter 3「unfavorable and this is the peer is it she observed in a tone by no means expressive of approval as she stood on the hotel veranda on the day of her arrival and contemplated the rather limited prospect that was bounded at one end by the casino and at the other by the coal elevator. If those smelly little stones out there are the rocks that people talk about at such a rate, I must confess that I am disappointed in them. Mr. Port hastened to assure her that the rocks were in quite a different direction and if that is the casino while well, it seems a nice sort of a place i really think that they might have managed the arch so as not to have that horrid green house showing under it and what little poor affairs the hotels are really uncle hutchinson i don't see what there is in this little place to make such a fuss about Dorothy, replied Mr. Port, with much solemnity, you evidently forget, though I certainly have mentioned the fact to you repeatedly, that the climate of this portion of Rhode Island is the most distinctly antibilious climate to be found upon the whole coast of North America for persons possessing delicate livers. Oh, bother delicate livers, at least. I beg your pardon, Uncle Hutchinson, for an expression of such positive pain had come into Mr. Port's face at this irreverent reference to an organ that he regarded as sacred that even Dorothy was forced to make some sort of an apology. Of course, I don't want to bother your poor liver more than it is bothered anyway. But, you know, I haven't got a liver, and I don't care for climates a bit. What I mean is, what do people do here to have a good time? In the morning replied Mr. Port. They bathe, and in the afternoon they drive to the point. This morning we shall bathe, Dorothy. Bathing is an admirable liver tonic, and this afternoon we shall drive to the point. Good heavens, is that all? exclaimed Miss Lee. 
why it's worse than saratoga do you mean to say uncle hutchinson that people don't dance here and don't go yachting and don't have lunch parties and don't play tennis and don't even have afternoon teas i believe that some of these things are done here replied mr port in a tone that implied that such frivolities were quite beyond the lines of his own personal interest yes he continued i am sure that all of them are done here now for the pier is not what it used to be dorothy the quiet air of intense respectability that characterized narragansett when it was the resort only of a few of the best families of philadelphia has departed from it i fear forever but thank heaven its climactic characteristics remain intact when you are older dorothy and your liver asserts itself you will appreciate this incomparable climate at its proper value well it hasn't asserted itself yet you know and i must say i'm devoutly thankful that something has happened to wake up the quiet and intensely respectable philadelphians before i had to come here but i'm very glad dear uncle hutchinson miss lee continued winningly that this climate is so good for you and i'm sure i hope that you won't have a single bilious attack all the time that you are here and you'll take your angel to the dances and to see the tennis and you'll give her lunch parties you'll take her yarding won't you you dear but i know you will and if this were not such a very conspicuous place and might make a scandal i give you a very sweet kiss to pay you in advance for all the trouble that you are going to take to make your angel enjoy herself you needn't bother about the teas uncle hutchinson for the most part they're only women and stupid being still somewhat cast down by painful memories of that trying final fortnight in saratoga during which he and his niece had pulled so strongly in opposite directions mr port heard with a lively alarm this declaration of a plan of campaign which if carried out would wreck hopelessly his own comfort of body and peace of mind obviously this was no time for faltering if the catastrophe was to be averted he must speak out at once and with a decisive energy i need not tell you dorothy he began speaking in a most grave and earnest tone that it is my desire to discharge in the amplest and kindest manner my duties toward you as a guardian i'm sure of it and of course you needn't tell me you dearest dear and we might begin with just a little lunch to-day the breakfast was horrid and i didn't get half enough even of what there was but i must say now mr port went on keenly regretting the unfortunate beginning that he had given to his declaration of independence but judiciously ignoring dorothy's shrewd perversion of it that your several suggestions literally are impossibilities i admit that dancing for a short period at about an hour after each meal is an admirable exercise that produces a most salutary effect upon the digestive apparatus but persistent dancing until an unduly late period of the night is a practice as unhygienic as in the mixed company of a watering place it is socially objectionable tennis is an absurdity worthy of the vacuous minds of those who engage in it to suggest that i shall sit in a cramped position in a draughty gallery for several hours at a stretch in order to watch empty-headed young men playing a perverted form of battledore and shuttlecock 
across a net is to imply that they and i are upon the same intellectual level and this i trust is not the case as you certainly should remember dorothy all persons of a bilious habit suffer severely from seasickness a fact that of course disposes effectually of your yachting plans for you are not desirous i am sure of pursuing your own selfish enjoyment if you possibly can have enjoyment on board a yacht at the cost of my intense personal misery but in regard to the lunches my dear mr port's tone softened perceptibly there certainly is something to be said the food here at the hotel i admit is atrocious and at the casino it is possible occasionally to procure something edible yes i shall have much pleasure in giving a lunch this very morning to my angel mr port warming in advance under the genial influence of the croquette and salad that he intended to order became playful for what you said in regard to the breakfast dorothy was quite true it was abominable if you will excuse me i will just step down to the casino now and give my order then things will be ready for us when we get back from the bath and such was miss lee's generalship that she rested content with her success in one direction and deferred until a more convenient season her further demands she was a reasonable young woman and was quite satisfied with accomplishing one thing at a time end of chapter four Chapter Five of the Uncle of an Angel by Thomas A. Janvier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five. Two or three days later, Dorothy advanced her second parallel. In the interval, they had bathed every morning and had driven to the point every afternoon and they had held converse upon the veranda of the hotel every evening until ten o'clock with certain eminently respectable people from philadelphia by whom dorothy was bored as she did not hesitate to confess almost to desperation further mr port had given a lunch party to which these same philadelphians were invited and his niece had informed him when the festivity was at an end that if he did anything like that again she certainly would either run away or drown herself any trials in this world or any dangers in the next she declared were preferable to sitting opposite to such a person as mrs logan rittenhouse who talked nothing but uninteresting scandal and crochet and next to mr peddington brown who talked only about people's great-grandfathers and great-aunts it was with a lively alarm that mr port noted these signs of discontent together with returning symptoms of grumpiness which had disturbed his comfort and digestion at saratoga and it was most selfishly in his own self-interest that he tried to think of something that would afford his niece amusement miss lee when she perceived that her intelligently laid plans were working successfully was graciously pleased to assist him it is a great pity uncle hutchinson 
she vouchsafed to remark on the fourth day of suppressed domestic sunshine that you don't like tennis don't you think for your angel's sake that you could go for just a little while this afternoon there's going to be a capital match this afternoon and your angel does so want to see it you haven't been very very agreeable the past two or three days you dear and i fear that your liver must be a little out of order really you haven't given your angel a single chance to be affectionate and unless she can be affectionate and sweet and clinging and things like that you know your poor angel is not happy at all suppose we try tennis for just half an hour or so it won't be much of a sacrifice for you and it will make your angel so happy that she will make herself dearer to you than ever you precious thing this form of address was disconcerting to mr port for during the period to which miss lee referred he certainly had been trying not very cleverly perhaps for such efforts were not at all in his line but still to the best of his ability to make himself as agreeable as possible and the effort on the part of his niece to be angelic of which she spoke so confidently he could not think but had fallen rather more than a little short of absolute success the one ray of comfort that he extracted from dorothy's utterance was her reference to herself as his angel he had come to understand that the use of this term was a sign of fair weather and he valued it accordingly but even for the sake of fair weather mr port was not yet prepared to expose his elderly joints to the draughty discomforts of the galleries overhanging the tennis court and he said so pretty decidedly almost anything else he was willing to do he added but that particular thing he would not do at all as you please uncle hutchinson dorothy answered in a tone of gloomy resignation i am used to hearing that it is just what poor dear mamma used to say she always was willing you know to do everything but the thing that i wanted her to do i remember just to mention a single instance how mamma broke up a delightful water party at windermere that sir gordon graham had arranged expressly for us the weather was rather misty as it is apt to be up there you know but nothing worth minding when you are well wrapped up but mamma said that if she went out in such a drizzle she knew her cough would be ever so much worse and of course she couldn't really know that it would be worse for nobody really knows what the weather is going to do to them and so she wouldn't go and sir gordon was very much hurt about it and never came near us again and unless i'm very much mistaken uncle hutchinson mamma's selfishness that day lost me the chance of being lady graham so i'm used to being treated in this way you needn't at all mind refusing me everything that i ask and being delivered of this discourse miss lee lapsed into a condition of funereal gloom at the end of another twenty-four hours mr port knuckled under i have been thinking dorothy he said about what you were saying about tennis it's a beastly game but since you insist upon seeing it i'll take you for a little while this afternoon this was not the most gracious form of words in which such an invitation could be couched but dorothy who was not a stickler for forms provided she was successful in results accepted in alacrity later in the day as they returned from the casino she declared 
your angel has had a lovely afternoon uncle hutchinson and she is sure that you have had a lovely afternoon too and now that you've found what fun there is in looking at tennis we'll go every day won't we dear sometimes you know you are just a little just a very little prejudiced about things but you are so good sweet-tempered that your prejudices never last long and so your angel cannot help loving you a great deal mr port who was not at all sweet-tempered at the moment was prepared to reply to the first half of the speech in terms of some emphasis for he was limping a little and a shocking twinge took him in his left shoulder when he attempted to raise his arm but dorothy's sudden shifting to polite personalities was of a nature to choke off his projected indignant utterance yet not feeling by any means prepared to meet in kind her pleasing manifestations of affection mr port was a little put to it to find any suitable form of response after a moment's reflection he abandoned the attempt to reply coherently and contented himself with grunting hmm. end of chapter five Chapter Six of the Uncle of an Angel by Thomas A. Janvier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six. Encouraged by the success that was attending her unselfish efforts to harmonize her own and her uncle's conceptions of the temporal fitness of things miss lee began to find life at the pier quite supportable there's not much to do here she declared with her customary candor and the hotels all ugly and all in a row make it look like an overgrown charitable institution and most of the people i must say are such a dismal lot that they might very well be the patients out for an airing. But on the whole, I've been in several worse places, Uncle Hutchinson. And if only you'd take me to a hop now and then, instead of sitting every evening on the pokey hotel veranda talking Philadelphia twaddle with that stuffy old Mr. Pennington Brown, I might have rather a good time here. You will oblige me, Dorothy, replied Mr. Port, by refraining from using such words as stuffy in connection with a gentleman who belongs to one of the oldest and best families in Philadelphia, and who, moreover, is one of my most esteemed friends but he is stuffy uncle hutchinson he never talks about anything but who people's grandfathers and grandmothers were and watson's annals seems to be the only book that he ever has heard of indeed i do truly think that he is the very stuffiest and stupidest old gentleman that i ever have known mr port made no reply to this sally for his feelings were such that he deemed it best not to give expression to them in words but he was not unnaturally surprised after such a declaration of sentiments on the part of his niece when she begged to be excused on the ensuing afternoon from her regular drive to the point on the ground that she had promised to make an expedition to the rocks in mr brown's company had an opportunity been given him 
Mr. Port would have asked for an explanation of this phenomenon, but the carriage was in waiting that was to convey his ward and her extraordinary companion to the end of the road at Indian Rock, a slight rheumatic tendency that he declared was hereditary, rendering it advisable for Mr. Brown to reduce the use of his legs to a minimum, and before Mr. Poor could rally his forces, they had entered it and driven away. In the evening, Mr. Port found another surprise awaiting him. Miss Lee presently retired from the veranda for the avowed purpose of searching for a missing fan, thus leaving the two gentlemen together. "'What a charming girl your niece is, Port,' said Mr. Brown, as the fluttering train of Dorothy's dress disappeared through the doorway. Mr. Port evidently considered this possible debatable statement was sufficiently answered by a grunt, for that was all the answer he gave it. Not permitting his enthusiasm to be checked by this chillingly dubious response, Mr. Brown continued, she certainly is one of the most charming girls i have met in a long time port she is not a bit like the average of young girls nowadays i rarely have known a young person of either sex to be so genuinely interested in genealogy especially in philadelphia genealogy i must say that her liking for antiquarian matters generally is very remarkable I envy you, I really envy you, old boy, the blessing of that sweet young creature's companionship. Huh, do you, was Mr. Port's concise and rather discouraging reply. Indeed I do. Mr. Brown was too warm to notice the cynical tone of his friend's rejoinder. And I have been thinking, Port, that we are a pair of selfish old wretches to monopolize every evening in the way that we have been doing this bright young flower. It is a shame for us to keep her in our stupid company, though she tells me that she finds our talk about old people and old times exceedingly interesting. Instead of letting her have a little of the young society and a little of the excitement and pleasure of watering place life, now how would it do for us to take her down to the casino tonight? There is to be a hop tonight, she says, at least that is to say. Mr. Brown became somewhat confused. I hear somewhere that there is a hop tonight. While that sort of thing is pretty stupid for you and me, it isn't a bit stupid for a young and pretty girl like her. So suppose we take her, old man. As this amazing proposition was advanced by his elderly friend, Mr. Port's anger and astonishment were aroused together, and his rude rejoinder to it was, Have you gone crazy, Brown? Or has Dorothy been making a fool of you? Has she asked you to ask me to take her to the casino hop? She knows there is no use in talking to me about it any longer. No, certainly not. At least, that is to say, well, no, not exactly, replied Mr. Brown, beginning his sentence with an asperity and positiveness that somehow did not hold out to its end. She did say to me, I confess, how fond she was of dancing, and how she had refrained from saying much about it to you. Mr. Port here interpolated a skeptical snort. Because she knew that taking her to the casino would only bore you, and I do think, Port, that keeping her with us all the time is grossly selfish, and if you don't want to take her to the hop, I hope you let her go with me. But what we'd better do, old man, is to take her together. 
then we can talk to each other just as well at least nearly as well as we can here and we can have the comfort of knowing that she is enjoying herself too come hutch we're getting old and rusty you and i but let us try at least to keep from degenerating into a pair of selfish old brutes with no care for anybody's comfort but our own mr hutchinson port might have replied with a fair amount of truth that so far as he himself was concerned the degeneration that his friend referred to as desirable to avoid already had taken place but all of us like most to be credited with the virtues of which we have least and he therefore accepted as his due mr brown's tribute of implied praise and the upshot of the matter was that dorothy when she returned to the veranda again was unaffectedly surprised and considering how carefully she had planned her small campaign she did it very creditably by discovering that her uncle's edict against the casino hops had been withdrawn. End of chapter 6"'Chapter Seven of The Uncle of an Angel by Thomas A. Janvier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven Even Dorothy was disposed to believe that unless some peculiarly favorable combination of circumstances presented itself as a basis for her intelligent manipulation, her strong desire for a yacht voyage must remain ungratified, for now that his liver was decidedly the larger part of him, Mr. Port had a fairly cat-like dread of the sea. To be sure, Dorothy's character was a resolute one, and her staying powers were quite remarkable. But in the matter of venturing his bilious body upon the ocean, she discovered that her uncle, although now reduced to a fairly satisfactory state of submission in other respects, had a large and powerful will of his own. Fortune, however, favors the resolute even more decidedly than she favors the brave. This fact Dorothy comprehended thoroughly and uniformly acted upon each time that even a remote possibility of a yacht cruise presented itself she instantly brought her batteries to bear and with a nice understanding of her uncle's intellectual peculiarities she each time treated the matter as though it never before had been discussed Therefore it was that when Miss Lee's eyes were gladdened one day, just as she and her uncle were about to begin their lunch on the shady veranda of the casino, by the sight of a trim schooner yacht sliding down the wind from the direction of Newport, the subject of the cruise was revived with a suddenness and point that Mr. Port found highly disconcerting. The yacht rounded to off the casino, and the sound of a plunge and a clanging chain floated across the water as her anchor went overboard. Oh, isn't she a beauty? exclaimed Dorothy with enthusiasm. Now, Uncle Hutchinson, her owner, is coming ashore. They have just brought the gig round to the gangway, 
and if you don't know him you must get somebody to introduce you to him and then you must introduce him to me and then he will ask us to go on a cruise and of course we will go and have just the loveliest time in the world i haven't been on board of a yacht for nearly five years just look at that gig don't the men pull splendidly not since that nice little lord alderhone took poor dear mamma and me up to norway we did have such a good time poor dear mamma of course was desperately sick she always was horribly seasick you know but i'm never seasick the least bit and it was perfectly delightful look uncle hutchinson they made the dock and now he's coming right up here what a handsome man he is and how well he looks in his club uniform it seems to me i've seen him somewhere do you know him uncle hutchinson a serious difficulty under which mr port labored in dealing with his niece was his inability due to his philadelphia habit of mind to keep up with the exceptionally rapid flow of her ideas on the present occasion while he still was engaged in consideration of the irrational proposition that he should court the desperate misery that attends a bilious man at sea by as good as asking to be taken on a yacht voyage he suddenly found his ideas twisted off into another direction by the reference to his sister's sufferings on a similar occasion in the past and before he could frame in words the reproof that he was disposed to administer to dorothy for what he probably would have styled her heartlessness he found his thoughts shunted to yet another track by a direct question it is within the bounds of possibility that miss lee had arrived at a just estimate of her relative's intellectual peculiarities and that she even sometimes framed her discourses with a view to taking advantage of them the direct question being the simplest section of dorothy's complex utterance mr port abandoned his intended remonstrance and reproof and proceeded to answer yes he said i know em. it's van rensselaer livingstone his cousin van ruder livingstone married your cousin grace grace winthrop you know he's a great scamp this one i mean gambles and that sort of thing i'm told and drinks and various things i shall have to speak to him if he sees me i suppose but of course i shall not introduce him to you mr van rensselaer livingstone why so it is how perfectly delightful i know him very well uncle hutchinson he was in nice the last winter we were there and he broke the bank at monaco and he played that perfectly absurd trick on little prince poretti cut off his little black moustache when prince poretti was was not exactly sober you know and gummed on a great red moustache instead of it and then before the prince was quite himself again took him to lady oresby's ball all nice was in a perfect roar over it and they had a duel afterwards and mr livingstone he is a wonderful shot instead of hurting the little prince just shot away the tip of his left ear as nicely as possible oh he is a delightful man and here he comes and dorothy half rising from her chair and paying no more attention to mr port's kicks under the table than she did to his smothered verbal remonstrances 
extended her well-shaped white hand in the most cordial manner, and in the most cordial tone exclaimed, "'Won't you speak to me in English, Mr. Livingstone? We talked French, I think it was, the last time we met. And how is your friend Prince Moretti? Has his ear grown out again? You know my uncle, I think, Mr. Hutchinson Port.' Livingstone took the proffered hand with even more cordiality than it was given, and then extended his own to Mr. Port, who seemed much less inclined to shake it than to bite it. "'I think we are justified in regarding ourselves as relations now, Miss Lee, since our cousins have married each other, you know. Quite a romance, wasn't it? And how very jolly it is to meet you here!' when I thought you certainly were in Switzerland or Norway, or even over in that new place that people are going to in Romania. I flatter myself that I always have rather a knack of falling on my feet, but by Jove I am doing it more than usual this morning. Miss Lee seemed to be entirely unaware of the fact that her uncle was looking like an animated thundercloud. It is just like a bit out of a delightful novel, was her encouraging response. A long, low black schooner suddenly coming in from seaward and anchoring close offshore, and the hero landing in a little boat, just in time to slay the villain and rescue the beautiful bride. Of course, I'm the beautiful bride, but my uncle is not a villain, but the very best of guardians. By the way, I don't think that you know that poor dear Mamma is dead, Mr. Livingstone. Yes, she died only a week or two after you left us. So you see, you must be very nice to the villain, and you can begin your kind treatment of him by having lunch with him and with me too. Uncle Hutchinson was so pleased when he saw you come ashore. He said that we certainly must capture you and he sent a man to bring some hot soup for you at once. Here it is now. And so it was, for Dorothy herself very thoughtfully had given the order that she now modestly attributed to her uncle. And so, in less than ten minutes from the moment when Mr. Port had informed Dorothy that Van Rensselaer Livingstone was a very objectionable person, whom he desired to avoid, and whose introduction to her was not even to be thought of, they all three were lunching together in what to the casual observer seemed to be the most amicable manner possible. End of chapter 7「Eight of the Uncle of an Angel » by thomas a janvier this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight i've run over to look up mrs rattleton said livingstone as he discussed with evident relish the fillet that mr port charitably hoped would choke him very likely you haven't met her for she's only just got here but you'll like her i know for she's ever so jolly she's promised to play propriety for me in a party that we want to make up aboard the yacht the squadron won't get down from new york for a week yet and I've come up ahead of it so that we can have a cruise to the shoals and back before the races. Of course, Miss Lee, you won't fly in the face of fate after this providential meeting by refusing to join our party. At least, if you do, you will make me wretched to the end of my days." "'And we will try to make you comfortable on board, sir,' he added politely, turning to Mr. Port. "'I have a tolerably fair cook, and ice isn't the only thing in the ice-chest, I assure you.' 
how very kind of you mr livingstone dorothy hastened to say in order to head off her uncle's inevitable refusal of course we will go with the greatest possible pleasure it is very odd how things fall out sometimes now only this morning i was begging uncle hutchinson to take me off yachting and he was saying how much he enjoyed being at sea and how he really thought that if it wasn't for his age wasn't it absurd of him to talk about his age he is not old at all the dear he would have a yacht of his own and almost before the words are fairly out of our mouths here you draw from the clouds or are cast up by the sea it's all the same thing and give us both just what we have been longing for at least uncle hutchinson pretended to be longing for it only in case he could be young enough to enjoy it but if he doesn't think he's young now i'd like to know what he'll call himself when he's fifty and then facing around sharply upon her uncle dorothy concluded the idea of pretending that you are too old to go yachting really uncle hutchinson i am ashamed of you as has been intimated if there was any one subject upon which Mr. Port was especially sensitive, it was the subject of his age. As the parish register of St. Peter's all too plainly proved, he never would see sixty again. But this awkward record was in an out-of-the-way place, and the agreeable fiction that he advanced in various indirect ways to the effect that he was a trifle turn of forty-seven was not likely to be officially contradicted and it is not impossible so tenacious was he upon this point that had the official proof been produced he would have denied its authenticity for it was mr port's firm determination still to figure before the world as a youngish middle-aged man to say that miss lee deliberately set herself to playing upon this weakness of her guardians possibly remotely possibly would be doing her injustice but the fact is obvious that she succeeded by her cleverly turned discourse in landing her esteemed relative fairly between the horns of an exceedingly awkward dilemma. Either Mr. Port must accept the invitation and be horribly ill, or he must reject it and so throw over his pretensions to elderly youth for a moment the unhappy gentleman hung in the wind and dorothy regretted that she had not made her statement of the case still stronger indeed she was about to supplement it by a remark to the effect that people never thought of giving up yachting until they were turned of sixty when to her relief her uncle slowly filled away on the right tack his acceptance was expressed in highly ungracious terms, but, as has been said, Dorothy never troubled herself about forms, provided she compassed results. The moment that he had uttered the fatal words, Mr. Port fell to cursing himself in his own mind for being such a fool. But the same reason that had impelled him to give his consent withheld him from retracting it he knew that he was going to be desperately miserable but at least nobody could say that he was old i'm ever so much obliged to you miss lee and to you too mr port said livingstone and now if you'll excuse me i'll go and hunt up mrs rattle tun and tell her what a splendid raise i've made and help her organize the rest of the party. We shall have only two more. It's a bore to have more than six people on board a yacht. 
I don't know why it is, I'm sure, but if you have more than six, they always get to fighting. Queer, isn't it? I beg your pardon, said Mr. Port. Mrs. Rattleton? May I ask if this is the Mrs. Rattleton from New York, who was here last season, the one whose bathing costume was so, so very eccentric, and about whom there was so much very disagreeable talk? Mrs. Rattleton is from New York, and she was here last season, Livingston answered. But I can't say that I remember anything eccentric in her bathing costume, except that it was exceedingly becoming, and I certainly never heard any disagreeable talk about her. There may have been such talk about her, but perhaps it was thought just as well not to have it in my presence. Mrs. Rattleton is my cousin, Mr. Port. She was a Van Twiller, you know. Do you happen to remember any of the things that were said about her, and who said them? Livingstone spoke with extreme courtesy, but there was something in his tone that caused Mr. Port suddenly to think of the tip of Prince Sporetti's left ear that led him to reply hurriedly and by no means lucidly, Certainly, no, yes, that is to say, I can't exactly remember anything in particular. I'm sure I was led to believe from what was said that she was a very charming woman. No, I don't remember at all. Ah, perhaps it is just as well, Livingstone replied gravely. But how lucky, he added, there she is now. Everybody is at the casino about this time of day, I fancy. May I bring her over and present her to you, Miss Lee? Of course you may, Mr. Livingstone. I shall be delighted to meet her. And if she is to matronize me, the sooner that I begin to get accustomed to her severity is the better. And then Mr. Hutchinson Port suffered a fresh pang of misery when the presentation was accomplished, and he was forced to say approximately pleasant things to a lady whose decidedly ballet-like attire in the surf, or to be precise, on the beach above high-water mark, were for some occult reason she usually saw fit to do the most of her bathing, joined to the exceeding celerity of her conduct generally, had marked her during the preceding season as the conspicuous center of one phase of life at the pier. Nor was Mr. Port's lot made happier as he listened to the brisk discussion that ensued in regard to the organization of the yachting party, and found that the two remaining members were to be drawn, as was only natural, from the eminently meteoric set to which Mrs. Rattleton belonged. Had time been given Mr. Port for consideration, it is probable that he would have collected his mental forces sufficiently to have enabled him to lodge a remonstrance. He might even, though this is doubtful, for Dorothy's voting power was vigorous, have accomplished a veto. But projects in which Mrs. Rattleton was concerned never went slowly and in the present case the necessity for getting back in time for the races really compelled haste. And so it came to pass that not until the fleet wings was off the Brenton's reef light ship, with her nose pointed well up into the northeast, was there framed in Mr. Port's slow-moving mind a suitable line of argument on which to base a peremptory refusal to go upon the expedition. And by that time he was so excruciatingly ill in his own cabin that coherent utterance and converse with his kind were alike impossible. So far as Mr. Port was concerned, the ensuing six days made up an epoch in his life that can only be described as an agonized blank. And when, 
as it seemed to him many ages later the fleet wings once more cast anchor off narragansett pier and he stepped shakily from the schooner's gig to the casino dock the usual plumpness and ruddiness of his face had given place to a yellow leanness and his weight had been reduced by very nearly twenty pounds the cruise had been a flying one or he never would have finished it after the first six hours he would have landed on a desert island cheerfully and it is not impossible that a hint from dorothy as to her uncle's probable movements should a harbor be made had induced Livingstone to give the land a wide berth. Dorothy came ashore blooming. You don't know, Uncle Hutchinson, she said, what a perfectly lovely time I had. And this cheerful assertion was the literal truth, for Mr. Port had entered his cabin before the yacht had crossed the line between Beaver Tail and Point Judith, and had not emerged from it until the anchor went overboard. And you don't know, Miss Lee went on with effusion, how grateful your angel is to you for helping her to have such a delightful cruise. I'm sorry that you haven't been very well, Uncle Hutchinson, but I know that you will be all the better for it. Poor dear Mamma, you know, was bilious too, and going to sea always made her wretched. But she used to be wonderfully well always when she got on shore again. And you'll be wonderfully well too, you dear. And that will be your reward for helping your angel to have such a perfectly delightful time. Mr. Port made no reply to this address for his condition of collapse was too complete to permit him to give form to words to the thoughts of rage and resentment which were burning in the depths of his injured soul without a word to one single member of the party he climbed heavily into a carriage and was driven directly to his hotel while dorothy under the chaperonage of mrs rattleton gaily joined the pleasant little lunch party at the casino with which the yacht voyage came to an end end of chapter eight chapter nine of the uncle of an angel by thomas a janvier this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 During the ensuing week, a considerable portion of which Mr. Port passed in the privacy of his own room, the relations between Miss Lee and her guardian were characterized by a chill formality that was ominous of a coming storm in point of fact mr port was waiting only until he should fully regain his strength in order to try conclusions with dorothy once and for all and he was most highly resolved that in the impending battle royale he should not suffer defeat. So far he had gone down in each encounter with his spirited antagonist because the tactics employed against him were of an unfamiliar sort. But he was beginning to get the hang of these tactics now, and he also had got what in fighting parlance would have been styled his second wind, as he thought of the wrongs which had been heaped upon him, rage filled his breast, and the strong determination slowly shaped itself within him that to the finesse of the enemy he would oppose a solid front of brute force. Astuteness was not the least marked 
of Miss Lee's many charming characteristics, and although her guardian gave no outward sign of his belligerent intentions, she felt an inward conviction that a decisive trial of strength between them was at hand. Five or six years earlier, she had engaged in such a trial of this nature with her mother, and had emerged from it victorious. In that case, feminine weakness had yielded to feminine strength. But now the gloomy thought assailed her that her uncle, while closely resembling her mother in the matter of his liver, had in the depths of his torpid nature a substratum of brutal masculine resolution against which, should it fairly be set in array, she might battle in vain. And the upshot of her meditations was the conviction that her only chance of success lay in avoiding a battle by a radical change of base. An easy way, as she perceived, to effect such a change of base was to marry Van Rensselaer Livingstone. Indeed, his proposal, a couple of days after the yacht voyage ended, came so opportunely that she almost was surprised into accepting it out of hand. But Dorothy was too well balanced a young person to do anything hastily, even to get herself out of a tight place, and while she held Livingstone's proposal under advisement, as a line of retreat kept open for use in case of urgent necessity, she welcomed it less for the opportunity of a safer position that it offered than for those which it suggested in her fertile mind. Marriage, she decided, was the only way by which she could score a final victory over her uncle, and at the same time spike his guns. But it did not necessarily follow that her marriage must be with Livingstone. Indeed, as her coolly intelligent mind perceived, marrying an unmanageable young man, in order to be free of an unmanageable old one, would be simply walking out of the frying pan into the fire and that was not at all the resolution of her difficulties that Dorothy sought. The plan that now began to shape itself in her mind was one by which both fire and frying pan would be successfully avoided, and as the more that she examined into it, the more desirable it appeared to her she lost no time in carrying it into effect, whereby in less than three days' time she sent Mr. Van Rensselaer Livingstone away in such a rage that he put to sea in the very face of a threatening northeaster, and in as much shorter period she caused her uncle seriously to doubt the evidence of his own senses. At the end of his week of retirement, Mr. Port found himself in the hale condition of a bilious giant refreshed with blue pills. He looked a little thinner than when he had started upon his ill-starred cruise, and his usual ruddiness was not as yet fully restored, but he was in capital condition and a good deal more than ready for Miss Lee to come on. He could not very well, in the nature of the case, start an offensive campaign, but at the very first suggestion on Dorothy's part of the slightest desire to engage again in any of the various forms of frivolous amusement by which she had made his life a burden to him, he was loaded and primed to go off with a bang that he believed would settle her. And such is the perversity of human nature 
Mr. Port presently became not a little annoyed by Dorothy's failure to supply the spark that was to touch him off. In fact, her conduct was bewilderingly strange. She drew away from the lively circle of which Mrs. Rattleton was the animated center, and voluntarily associated herself with the elderly and very respectable Philadelphians whose acquaintance she previously had it so emphatically declined. Still further, to Mr. Port's astonishment, the lady and gentleman especially singled out by Miss Lee, as most in accord with her newly acquired tastes, were the severe Mrs. Logan Rittenhouse and that lady's staid brother, Mr. Pennington Brown. At the feet of the former, quite literally, she sat as a disciple in crochet, and listened the while with every outward sign of interest to the dull record of the South Fort Street scandals of the past and West Walnut Street scandals of the present, which this estimable matron poured into her ears by the hour at a time. And in a quiet corner of the veranda, Mr. Brown's eyesight having failed a little so that he found reading rather difficult, she read aloud to the latter from Watson's Annals and listened with a pleased satisfaction to his comments upon her selections from this, the Philadelphia Bible, to the numerous anecdotes of a genealogical and antiquarian caste which thus were recalled to his mind. Possibly the reading from Watson were continued in the afternoons, when Miss Lee and Mr. Brown regularly went down to the rocks. So extraordinary was all this that Mr. Port admitted frankly to himself that he could make neither head nor tail of it. But he had an inborn conviction that such an unnatural state of affairs was not likely to last. There was good scriptural authority, he called to mind grimly, for the assertion that the leopard did not change his spots, nor the Ethiopian his skin. End of chapter 9《Chapter Ten of the Uncle of an Angel by Thomas A. Janvier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten. In accordance with the substantial customs of his fellow citizens, Mr. Port always returned to Philadelphia sharp on the first of September calmly ignoring the heat and the mosquitoes which are the dominant characteristics of philadelphia during that month and resting secure in the knowledge that the course which he pursued was that which his father and his grandfather had pursued before him it was on the eve of his departure from narragansett that his doubts and perplexities occasioned by dorothy's surprising conduct were resolved. Being seated in a snug corner of the veranda in company with Mr. Pennington Brown, Mr. Port was smoking a comforting cigar. Mr. Brown, who also was smoking, did not seem to find his cigar comforting. He smoked it in so fitful a fashion that it repeatedly went out and his nervousness seemed to be increased each time that he lighted it. Further, his comment upon Mr. Port's discourse, which was more than ordinarily thoughtful and accurate weighing of the relative merits of thin and thick soups, obviously were delivered quite at random. At first, Mr. Port was disposed to resent this inattention to his soulful utterances, 
but as the subject was one in which as he well knew his friend was profoundly interested he presently became uneasy what's the matter brown he asked in a tone of kindly concern is your rheumatism bothering you i've been afraid that your absurd sitting around on rocks with my knees would bring it on again you're not as young as you once were pen and you've got to take care of yourself i am not aware port mr brown answered rather stiffly that i am yet as conspicuously superannuated indeed i never felt younger in my life than i have felt during the past fortnight i have a little touch of rheumatism to-night he added frankly and at the same time gave unintentional emphasis to his admission by catching his breath and almost groaning as he slightly moved his legs but it has nothing to do with sitting on the rocks with door with your charming niece you forget that my rheumatism is hereditary port why i had an attack of it when i was only five and twenty all the same you would not have it now if you had spent your afternoon sensibly with me here on a dry veranda or properly wrapped up in a dry carriage instead of on damp rocks with the baggage what on earth has got into you i can't imagine if you were twenty years younger brown i should think yes positively i should think that you were in love with her port said mr brown with a tone of resentment in his voice i shall be very much obliged if you will not use such language when you are speaking of miss lee she is the best and kindest and noblest woman i have ever met you have most cruelly misunderstood her had you given her half a chance she would have been to you only a source of constant joy mr port replied this emphatic assertion by a low and most pointedly incredulous whistle you have not the slightest conception as such a comment shows mr brown continued with increasing asperity of the depths of sweetness and tenderness which are in her nature of her perfect unselfishness of the gentleness and truthfulness of her heart she is all that a woman can be and more she is she is an angel mr brown's elderly voice trembled as he made this avowal as for mr port his astonishment was almost too deep for words but he managed to say yes i suppose she is at least she has said so often enough herself for some seconds there was silence and then with a deprecating manner and in a voice from which a trace of resentment had disappeared mr brown resumed hutch old man you and i have been friends these many years together and you won't fail me in friendship now will you you are right i am in love with this sweet young creature and she think of it hutch she has admitted that she is in love with me not romantically in love for that would be not absurd of course but a little unreasonable for while i'm not at all old yet i know of course that i'm not exactly what you call young but in love sensibly and rationally she wants to take care of me she says the dear child mr port grunted and she has such clever notions in regard to my health when we are married how strange and delightful it sounds hutch she says we will go immediately to Carlsbad, where the waters will do my rheumatism a world of good, and from there, when I am better, we will go on to Vienna, where the dry climate and the white wine, she thinks, 
still further will benefit me and from vienna in order to set me on my feet completely we are to go on to the north and spend a winter in russia for there is nothing that cures rheumatism so quickly and so thoroughly she says though i never should have imagined it a steady and long-continued cold just think of her planning it all out for me so well yes hutch i love her with all my heart and what has made me so nervous to-night is the great happiness has come to me it only came positively this afternoon and the dread that perhaps as her guardian you know you might not approve of what we have decided to do but you do approve don't you hutch of course in a few months she will be her own mistress and your consent to our marriage as she truly says then will be unnecessary but even a month seems a desperately long while to wait and that is the very shortest time she thinks in which she could get ready though the dear child has consented to wait for most of the little things which she wants until we get on the other side mr port smiled cynically at the announcement of this concession it struck him that when dorothy was turned loose among the paris shops backed by the capacious purse of a doting elderly husband she would mow a rather startling broad swath so you won't oppose our marriage will you old man you will consent to my having this dear young creature for my wife various emotions found place in mr port's breast as he listened to this extraordinary declaration and appeal at first he felt a lively anger at dorothy for having as he coarsely phrased it in his own mind so successfully gammoned mr pennington brown to this succeeded an evolutionary admiration of the clever way in which she had managed it and then a feeling of profound satisfaction possessed him as there came into his slow-moving mind a realizing sense of his own deliverance but mr port was not utterly selfish but that in the midst of the sunrise of happiness which dawned upon him with the opening of a way by which he decently could get rid of dorothy he was assailed by certain qualms of conscience as to the unfairness of thus casting upon his old friend the burden that he had found so hard to bear for the heaviness of mr port's mental processes prevented him from perceiving as a shrewder person would have perceived that dorothy was not the sort of young woman to engage in an enterprise of this nature without first fully counting the cost had he been keener of penetration he would have known that she could be trusted when safely landed in the high estate of matrimony to play on skilfully the game she had so skilfully begun that in her own interest she would manage matters in such a way as never to arouse in the mind of her elderly husband the awkward suspicion that the scheme of life arranged by his angel apparently with a view solely to his own comfort really was arranged only for the comfort of her angelic self it was while mr port wavered among his qualms of conscience hesitating between his great longing to chuck dorothy overboard and so have done with her and his sense of duty to mr pennington brown that the subject of his perplexities herself appeared upon the scene and her arrival at so critical a juncture seemed to suggest as a remote possibility that she had been all the while snuffing this particular battle from not very far off dear uncle hutchinson said miss lee with an affectionate fervor do you think that your angel is most cruel and horrid because she is willing to go off in this way after her own selfish happiness and leave you all alone but she won't do it dear if you would rather have her stay her only wish you know has been to make you comfortable and happy and you have been so good and kind to her that she is ready to sacrifice even her love for your sake yes if you would rather keep her to yourself she will stay only if she does stay and there was a warning tone of deep meaning in miss lee's well-modulated voice 
her heart of course will be broken and she will have to ask you to travel with her for two or three years into out-of-the-way parts of the world mr port shuddered until her poor broken heart gets well not that it ever will get quite well again you know but she will be brave and try to pretend for your sake that it has so it shall be just as you say dear only for pennington's sake who loves me so much uncle hutchinson i hope that perhaps you may be willing to let me go and having concluded this moving address miss lee extended one of her well-shaped hands to mr pennington brown who grasped it warmly for he was deeply moved by so edifying an exhibition of affection and dutiful unselfishness and with the other applied her handkerchief delicately to her eyes mr port was not the least moved by dorothy's profession of self-sacrifice but he was most seriously alarmed by her threat that opened before him a dismal vista of bilious misery to cart him for several years about the world on the pretext of a broken heart that required travel for its mending he believed to be sure that in a stand-up fight he could conquer dorothy but he had his doubts as to how long she could stay conquered and between constant fighting and constant travel there is not much choice for mr port knew from experience how acute is the form of biliousness which results from rage after all self-preservation is the first law of nature and under the stress thus put upon him therefore it is not surprising that mr port's qualms of conscience incident to his failure to do his duty to his neighbor vanished to the winds mr pennington brown still held dorothy's hand in his own will you make this great sacrifice hutch for your old friend he asked mr port hesitated a little for he felt a good deal like a criminal who was shifting his crime upon an innocent man and then he answered rather weakly both in tones and terms why of course dear uncle hutchinson how good you are exclaimed miss lee and you really think that you can spare your angel then and both promptly and firmly mr port answered yes i really think that i can end of chapter ten recording by susan morin portland maine end of uncle of an angel by thomas a janvier